Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to our artist talk, Reimagining the Body Politic in Southeast Asia in conversations with artists Lizzie Wee, uh, Shane Pua, Stephanie Burt, Kyun Dong, and our talk moderator, Wan Hui. Um, so I, yeah, we're very happy to have you here with us. I'm Cassie, uh, I'm Cassie from your workshop, and I'm going to, to start a session by briefly um, reiterating the talk synopsis and then presenting the works by these artists uh, currently showing at our gallery. Um, and then this will be followed by the artist talk and we will then conclude with a short Q&A. We have invited you to send questions um, ahead of the talk via an online forum, but if you find um, that you have another question at any point during the session, you could just put it in the chat and we will get to it in the end if, if we can. Um, so in this talk, we invite the artists here to share about how the artistic practices expand on the research and thinking of decoloniality and post-colonial perspectives. They, they demonstrate how the body politic is invariably tied to the home and embedded in familiar objects and narratives that reflect upon the Southeast Asian experience. So in the process of rewriting the individual self and the collective body, the artists also simultaneously reevaluate their relationship between the East and the West. So for context, um, here is an overview of ornamental. We envisioned it as, a, as an invitation back to the physical realm with an emphasis on aesthetics and materiality. And what we achieved is a multi-sensory experience with different colors, surfaces, textures, and lightings, making for eye-catching um, visuals and sights and audiovisual elements such as music and sound and even smells. So it's, to be exact, the show highlights and attentiveness towards the physicality of artworks as objects. It um, deliberates. Um, it deliberates on the decorative as critical whilst echoing a belief that art is bound to nothing but its own essence. And as one navigates um, through familiar portrayals of the home history or post-colonial to divides between public and private, home and state, consciousness, conscious and subliminal become increasingly blurred. With that said, we highly encourage you to visit our gallery to see, hear, and even um, smell for yourselves. The exhibition is on until 9th January, 2022. So um, this is a view of the installation with your back facing what was on the previous slide. And I'm going to begin my tour in this corner in the, um, on the right of this image. Uh, so Santi Wang Chuan is not part of this artist talk, but he's worth mentioning as the only male artist in the group show. And he is also a very respected um, figure, um, an artist and craftsman from Thailand, specifically the Eastern province in the, nor in the Northeast of the country. And for this show, he contributed over here, um, free form from weaving number two, this very large scale piece on this wall and flowers rain, um, which uh, um, is reminiscent of um, flower garlands in wedding processions hanging from the ceiling. And, um, and below it on the TV screens is um, the work a work by Kyun Dong called Black Sea with Goldfish. So first, to more about um, Kyun Dong. She is a Vietnamese artist who creates hyper real video works um, to provide an innate platform upon which she deliberately challenges cultural stereotypes. And her practice extends to also include performance and sculpture. She studied fine arts at Bern University of the Arts and completed a master's at Zurich University of the Arts. So in um, Black Sea with Goldfish, she questions the stereotypical image of Asia through the lens of Vietnamese art history and drawing the influences of lacquer painting in Vietnamese art to bring attention to the corporeal in relation to the construct of one's identity. The work bears the spirit of Chinese landscape painting, which strives for atmosphere over originality. And Dong further integrates Japanese Bhutto dance music into the landscape as a reflection of the body as a sculpture. She also made the video um, Under the Fireflies um, playing on, our, on the iPad at our entrance. Um, it appears to be humorous and whimsical, but it 
actually illustrates the tribulations and the hardships of the humble Vietnamese farm worker, whilst insinuating a deeper action of violence still pre prevalent today, which is the ongoing practice of beheading in the Vietnamese military. And such violence is further dramatized by the EDM soundscape um, Dong has created. And moving on is Stephanie Jane Birch. She's an artist whose practice spans from sculptural installations to fictional prose. She completed her studies at Glasgow School of Art and her work invites the viewer to explore dialogues between her installations and their settings through fictional narratives at times referencing film and literature. And her research looks across feminism, gender and, and analysis of girl culture and the Novu Roman. So um, her, her research is, can be, um, it can be seen in an installation uh, in our show, Romance Report Letters, which looks into the depiction of female characters in pieces of work, such as the Virgin's Suicides and the TV series Mad Men and romance comics, mainly published during the first three decades of the Cold War. And in these stories, these girls are cast in a tragic plight in the pursuit of love and happiness. And what Bert does is she takes the archival images of these comics and reimagines. You can see in the, in the bottom corner of the, of the frame. Um, and she recasts these characters um, away from a state of constant peril where they needed to be rescued by men all the time. And as part of this um, installation is also um, these uh, ro romance report letters um, two, three, and four. And completing the presentation are, are typewritten notes um, by the artist on the adjacent wall that expands on the source materials and thought process and the inspiration of romance report letters. And again, we invite you to come to the gallery to take a closer look. So um, next is Shane Poit. She graduated with a, a bachelor's honors in communication design from the Glasgow School of Arts, Singapore. And she, uh, she's formally trained in fine arts with ceramics being um, the predominant medium of her practice. Um, most of her works look into oral traditions, uh, Chinese folklores um, and cultural semiotics with the intention of embracing traditional cultures and this cultural homogenization. And in Padma Malayan, um, Shane draws on the ornate spectacle of the fountain and reimagines it in a new sculptural work that takes the form of the Rafflesia flower. And she references the native name Rafflesia, where it's more commonly known as Padma Raksasa or giant Padma in the region. And Padma in turn, turn is a Sanskrit word for lotus flower. So by highlighting the in indigenous origins of the flower, um, Poa challenges the objectivity of history that often favors the West. Um, and in a playful spin to decolonize um, our culture, she fills the Rafflesia with rose sira um, and let its fragrance takes, take one by surprise. And by bridging the political and mythical in, in imaginative ways, the artwork ultimately raises the questions against the glorification of, colo of um, colonial colonialism, colonialism in Singapore. And another um, work in a show by her is 1963 Death of Democracy, um, a ceramic, ceramic vessel which um, references the Titular Cold War event and the socialist part, political party presence socialist Soliasis in dialogue with Padma Malayan, which focuses more on Singapore as a post-colonial state. And last but not least um, is Lizzie Wee. And in this picture here, it's our multimedia video installation, Honey Trap, comprising a four minute NFT video um, and digital prints on the wall, as well as the, um, as the curtains, um, with those being scented by a fragrance that she created herself. And the setup, uh, and what the setup makes, makes an immersive and cozy space around the video projection playing in a corner. So here are some more details of the installation and I'm also gonna share the artist's biography now. She is a Singaporean artist, designer, illustrator, art director, and video editor who has lived in many cities, including Kuala Lumpur, Hong Kong, Berlin, Boston, New York, and Singapore. And she received her um, BFA from New York University and her master's of fine arts um, from La Salle College of the Arts. Her present practice-based research investigates notions of identity and belonging through an examination 
of female roles around um, in Southeast Asian pop culture and visual media. So on this slide, I encourage you to scan this QR code to see for yourself the trailer of Honey Trap on Rarible, where this work has been minted as an NFT so to better experience um, the video. So, um, well, and I'm going to, meanwhile, I will talk more about the concept behind this. So building on her extensive research on female archetypes in popular culture, um, the video Honey Trap examines notions of desire and seduction stereotypical of female characters as um, seen in Asian television series and in and movies. So she cross-referenced vintage magazines, including Penthouse and Playboy, and unpacks, and unpacks how women have been depicted to be desirable. So with phrases like gentle pleasures, give me young honey, taken from these magazines to popular lyrics um, from, song, from the song Like a Virgin, Touch for the very first time, she, uh, she records a sensual performance in the shower and frames a familiar yet disconcerting image of femininity through the years. And as you may, might see from the video, um, the prints hanging around in the installation are, is generated from, from the performance. So this concludes our exhibition tour. I want to thank you so much for your attention. And I, uh, if you would like to follow us for new news and updates about our artists and exhibitions, as we are a very happening um, gallery, um, please feel free to do so. And you can also scan the QR code at the bottom if you would like to be part of our mailing list and yeah, and, and keep, and keep up to, to date with, uh, with all of our events and programs, including such as this one. So yeah, now without further ado, I will hand this over to Wan Hui and the artists to begin the dialogue. Thank you, Cassie, for the introductions. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to remind the audience members again that you can submit questions to the artists using the Q&A function below at any time throughout our conversation. We will open up the discussion at the end to answer these questions. Let's begin with the overarching question about body politics. So to give everyone a little bit of context, the body politic in classical philosophy refers to human society as a collective, one that is eternal and transcends the mortality of any individual. The body politic found renewed meaning during the 1970s when women were reclaiming sovereignty over their own bodies under the second wave of feminism. This led to the slogan, the personal is political, being popularized at that time, and now extends to the various issues of race, sexuality, and class. So I'd like to ask the four artists, how is the body politic reflected in your practice? Maybe let's start the ball rolling with Lizzie, who uses her own body to reflect on the gender discourse. Lizzie, what are your thoughts on the personal being political in relation to your work, Honey Trap, that's in the exhibition? Uh, thank you, Wan Hui, um, for asking me that question. Uh, I think clearly um, the personal is political is still very relevant today. I think not just for me, but for many young women. And I think um, claiming sovereignty of one's own body is such an empowering move. And I think in my piece, Honey Trap, that's what I was uh, trying to do alongside kind of looking at this archetype of the seductress. I was very interested in um, filtering that through the lens of my own body and using my body as like a landscape for desire. Um, in my piece, I'm kind of bringing uh, the intimate and the sexual into a public view, which can be seen as political because it's definitely something that is a little bit out of the norm, especially in uh, an Asian context. Um, I think also being someone who didn't grow up here, uh, I, I'm kind of, struggling with um, these kind of opposing um, perspectives of being someone who's kind of grown up overseas and not really understanding fully the cultural context of both places and kind of trying to get some critical distance, maybe even from myself. I mean, since we're on the topic of female narratives and the representation of femininity, Stephanie, you leave fictional narratives of girl culture and Nova Roman in your sculptural installations. Maybe you wanna tell us more about why you turn to these fictional narratives and your play on materials to mediate your understanding of girlhood and womanhood in society. 
Yeah, thanks one way for asking me the question. Um, so a lot of my work actually looks at fiction as a starting point, film and literature especially. I think there is a lot of truth in fiction. Um, I don't see it any less real than someone writing an autobiography of their life. And I think a lot of these things, um, a lot of sit, well, the research that I looked at has a lot of sit, um, uh, discourse, I would say, around like women's inner lives or things that are uh, my obsessions in particular. So for instance, one filmmaker that I'm particularly drawn to is Sofia Coppola for her constant depiction of girls in this very transitory time of their life. And usually most of the times, um, this particular period between young teenagehood to adulthood is usually strived with a lot of tumultuous uh, uh, charged and emotionally charged experiences that usually don't go talk to, that don't get talked about as much or don't get light shine on as much and I think with some filmmakers like Sofia Coppola kind of looking at artificiality of prettiness of um, aesthetics as a construct to sort of dismantle patriarchal cultures I think that sort of mirrors in my work where I look at very feminine very pretty kind of uh, materials and position them against very harsh industrial materials to kind of give off this tension or give off this sort of seemingly, oh, these two things don't belong together. So what, what, is, what is actually happening within the sculpture? Why, why are they positioned together? What kind of questions are raised from there? So there's always this sort of internal struggle in a lot of my works. And I think the materials that I use and I pick out especially have to sort of advocate for this or have to sort of stand in for this struggle especially. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. I just went on a very long rant. <laughs> no, it's very interesting. I mean, in your new body of work, Women's Report Letters, you turn to comic anthologies yeah. from the 50s published in America. You know, why did these comics appeal to you and like, how do they perhaps resonate with the Southeast Asian experience? I think um, a lot of, when I was looking at this research, I actually stumbled across these sort of um, covers of Girl, girl magazines that were printed from the 1950s to 1970s in DC comics and all of them revolved around uh, marriage, getting married, uh, being uh, proposed to by the guy or sort of some sort of scandal in their love life and they were seen as sort of romance um, uh, advice for young girls during this period but I was very sort of drawn to the fact that wow, nothing has changed in the last de years of decades since the 1950s. These things still happen. You know, um, these, uh, these conversations are still being had. Um, the, the understanding of women and their ties to marriage, these things still go on, especially in 2021. And I was very much drawn to how this sort of like struggle for women's Oh, this came before the, the, the second wave of feminism, but I was just very much interested in how like the, um, the body of the women in all of these particular comics were always crying or they were always sort of uh, in peril. And, and I never saw a happy person. I never saw a happy woman. Like all, all, the only time when she was happy that was represented in his comics was when she was getting proposed to. And I was just like, oh, wow, this is... I, I mean, I just, it, it was just something that I picked up on and I wanted to sort of take it and sort of change or give light on this sort of narrative that was being spun for such a long time. It's spent for like 20 over years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's very interesting. Aside from the gender discourse, decoloniality and postcolonial thinking are also integral when we locate the body politic in Southeast Asia. So moving on to Shane. Your works in the exhibition Padma Malayan and 1963 Death of Democracy both touch on very specific political messages about colonialism. Why the interest in commenting on historical events like the arrest of the Barisan Socialist Party in 1963? Hi, thank you Wangri for the question. Um, I, I'm mainly um, influenced by historians and also uh, activists and also uh, political detainees of this period and also later in the uh, 70s and, 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 and onwards uh, where 
they always share about their experience of being detained and and also uh, especially um, my grandparents both side who uh, both share with me the story of this period and 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 I this is like a sort of a collective memory of uh, this in in especially in 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 this in Singapore and then um, and it's always very it's not very it's not it's not really the state narrative and 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 it's only in recent years where uh, more people get more vocal with uh, this period of time with uh, in from uh, in in the anti-colonial period and and I always uh, because being influenced by the uh, historian who share about this story I I see that like especially uh, 1959 where we got our independence uh, uh, it's where PAP got elected in uh, 1959 and it's a period where uh, there are a lot of democracy right uh, the, the people were more free at that period and but in 1963 it's it's period where they were being detained so so I think this this period of time is a very important history which I have not been exposed to when I was uh, younger in, in, in school. But this other story I heard mostly from my grandparents. And I have been searching uh, for this story, uh, for this narrative uh, when I was younger, but I couldn't really search on uh, the internet because it's not really out there yet. And so it's really a recent thing. Uh, yeah. So it's really, and, and, and then uh, there's this one time uh, relating to this talk, uh, this theme about how uh, personal is political. There's this one time where I show uh, one of the work I've shown before once, and then uh, there's an audience who asked me, so what has this got to do with you? <laughs> and, and it feels like, in, and, and then with this question, you can kind of see that like the personal is indeed political, right? In the sense where uh, uh, I sort of have to say why, uh, my personal input in this in order for me to talk about this part of the history so yeah I mean were you always politically invested in your practice it's only really recently when I started works which are more straightforwardly uh, political that I start to think about my other works as well I've always think I always thought that it wasn't very political it was just about uh my identity, my identity as someone who's very who brought up in a very Chinese speaking family, and uh, so I I work on a lot of uh, works about uh, uh, a lot about Chinese folklore and uh, cultural semiotics, but then I start to think that these are all very related to uh, politics as well. It's not so, even though it's it's not. It's not too uh, similar to the ones that I've created in this exhibition, which are very straightforwardly political. So I, I do think in that sense, um, if I say that you know, the personal is political, then I've always been very political. Yeah. I mean, the two works are definitely full of symbolic representations uh, if, if, if anyone has been into the exhibition. Um, Quinn, you also reflect on the post-colonial in your work as someone who is part of the Vietnamese diaspora living in Switzerland. How does the personal translate to the political in your work? In, in the work like Sea and Goldfish, I use a Buddha dancer and to perform all the figures like um, in the landscape that I created. And be, before using... Um, yeah, other performance, I, I perform it myself. And um, I, yeah, I was, I think I, I was just interested in performance and I was not aware of, of my body, nationality, identity, or <laughs> I was not from at the start. And somehow I was forced <laughs> to use my body as subject. So I didn't realize that, but in the end, that was always 
yeah, about Asian, about migration, about diaspora, about uh, Vietnam War, whatever, but it was not about the performance at all or art. So yeah, that was the starting point of my negotiation of, yeah, for, for that issue. And um, that was um, about, yeah. Why is, I mean, why is the body so significant for you in your practice? In all your works, you said you have used your, your own body and then you later, in your more recent works, you borrow the bodies of, of other people. So why is the body so significant for you? Um, um, first, the body itself is very center for, for performance. Um, and then afterwards, the body itself becomes like, <clears throat> I use it, yeah, as um, as image or as, as a symbol. I use it, at, yeah, to, to question or to, to confront, um, yeah, my, or my, uh, my. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the kind of makes sense of, of your own identity. Yeah, the look yeah. that I was born in. <laughs> <laughs> so, question the representation and the, yeah, mm -hmm. the position. Yeah, I mean, at the same time of bringing in various elements of Asian culture in your works, you also reference Western art history and literature. For instance, you know, with Japanese Buto dance, it can be traced back to German expressive dance in the 1920s. And, and under the fireflies, you refer to Swiss painter Ferdinand Hotler's The Woodcutter to articulate the struggles of the humble Vietnamese worker. So, I mean, this kind of brings me to my second question for all the artists. Um, how do you all consider the relationship between the East and West in your practice? So, as we know, the, the canon of art history is very much favors Eurocentricism. So how does your work challenge this perspective or reconcile you know, different aspects and influences from the two? Maybe Quinn, you wanna you wanna start? I'm interested in education, but what what happened in yeah, and um, uh, I'm interested in yeah, in in the education that was uh, bring like in the art education that was from the front. Who, who brought it to Vietnam and um, I, I was thinking if it it was connected to our tradition and culture or not and that is my interest uh, like at one point and, and the other point is also I I I also grew up in these two cultures. Like I lived in in both yeah continents <laughs> and experienced it. So I am interested in to think to challenge my viewers with different codes from both backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can definitely, definitely see that. I mean, you also mentioned about how a lot of French iconography also resonates very well, very much with Vietnamese culture in your works. Yeah. Yeah. In, in this work, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Shane, what about you? I mean, you're very particular about naming your work Padma Alliance so that we move away from the Western colonial perspective when reading the work. What are your thoughts about the East and West and why do you feel it's important to challenge this so-called objectivity of history? I, most of my work, like I just now have mentioned also that I, I, I work a lot of, on uh, Chinese mythology and oral tradition and which are usually uh, about my identity. And then, uh, but moving on to this work, it is uh, touching on uh, about a lot about the region and about 
uh, indigenous uh, culture. And, and this work itself also challenges my thought a lot and my problem, my issue with uh, uh, whenever there's this we East and West uh, discourse. And I always feel that uh, whenever, we, whenever we talk about the East and especially uh, in my former education, when we talk about the East, a lot of uh, a lot of example that's being brought up is usually uh, very uh, either Chinese or East Asian, and I just and I just feel like there are a lot of uh, over generalization of like this whole East, Eastern and Western, and how uh, they whenever we talk about East, we we say about how uh, Eastern are very collectivist, uh, and how Asian and and especially in Singapore Asian values. And then there's a lot to really debate about this Asian values because I feel that whenever people uh, say about Asian values, it's a lot. They 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 draw a lot of relation to Confucianism, but this this type of uh, beliefs and practices doesn't really relate to many other Asian. And so when when I do this work, I really think about how. We, we need to dive in deeper into each different experiences from of uh, uh, different, especially uh, brown people. And, and also uh, this is also why I, I tried in this work to, to look back into uh, how the flower was named uh, previously because it, it is not a refusia, it's, it's a Padma Raksasa or or, or many other variant native name. So I, I, I do think it's very important to uh, look also beyond the East and West and really dive into uh, more than East. Yeah. Uh, Stephanie, would you like to chime in on this? You also, I mean, you had your formal training in Glasgow before returning to Singapore to de develop your practice and your work. And your work also draws many references from Western films and literature. So do you recognize any tensions between the two in the context of Singapore and how do you resolve them? Hmm, that's a very uh, loaded question as well. <laughs> but I, I, I just want to comment that patriarchal systems exist both in the East and the West. It's a very big system that um, I, I feel that is still prevalent in both, in both cultures completely. Um, I think a lot of when I actually look at a lot of um, my practice, I'm very, very fascinated with, with like a certain archetype of a white woman. And this white woman presents herself in Gone Girl. I don't know if you've seen, if all of you are familiar with that film, but Gone Girl or Matt, Becky Draper in Mad Men, you know, she is this like, she's really at the top of the ladder. She has everything. Or even the girls in Sofia Coppola's version Suicides, they have everything, you know. And they really, really fascinate me because they're so miserable. And they are like, and and it's so it's to the point where in virgin suicides they take their own lives. And it continues like to be a mystery of why why someone at the, like who has everything would do that. And I think that that one aspect of like um, what I see maybe like between the East and the West is is maybe this idea or this archetype of someone who seemingly is at the top of the social hierarchy right you have like you're white you're privileged you have good education you have all of these things and yet you're so trapped by all of these things that you were raised with and I think that constantly um fascinates me how some how those trappings or those things which become which seem to afford women what you think as freedom actually become something which imprisons them instead and I guess like again if you know if you want to unpack these things like patriarchal systems in Singapore that's a whole long other one hour long talk in itself that we don't have to go into right now <laughs> but um I did I on that note like one thing I did feel um for, for my practice when I came back to Singapore was this understanding of contemporary art and conceptual art still very much predominantly a westernized concept it comes from the west um so that in this way you know we can't it's very hard to change I think things are happening in Asia things are happening even in China to kind of like bring up this conversation of conceptual and contemporary art practice but still predominantly it starts from the west and I think like that's just something that is just way history has been 
place down. And I think that more emphasis and I think more interesting things are happening now in Asia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, so then in your practice, like, you know, do you const like you you just embrace the Western perspectives in your perspective, or do you do you want to like actively challenge those perspectives? Mm, I don't really see. I think it's a bit like I think I just see myself as a global citizen. <laughs> Is that a word? Global citizen. Yeah. I I don't see myself. I mean, like, obviously I'm biracial and I'm mixed race, but I don't I don't think of it as a term of like oh right this is my western side and this is my I, I think it's very those it's just very limiting to who you are I think there's a conversation that needs to be held a wider discourse on what patriarchy is and how to navigate to navigate these power structures in the world that are usually still predominantly held up by men in every single sphere of society and how do we sort of I, I think this question moves between beyond being limited to east and west yeah yeah i mean queen also mentioned like previously about how the east and west is is a complete fabrication yeah um lizzie you also share a similar experience you know you completed your studies abroad and you you didn't grow up in singapore how has that influenced your practice uh yeah i think when i was listening to both quinn staff uh speaking about um you know I guess trying to break down this binary, this very set binary of East and West. And also Shane mentioned um, that there is kind of value in being more specific because of course, like I, I have a very unique experience in like growing up in so many different places, um, which is very different from let's say Steph's experience being bi biracial and also living in both um, uh, Glasgow and in Singapore. And I feel like there is value in being specific. And I think in my own particular practice, um, what I am trying to do is maybe similarly to Quinn, um, challenge viewers by bringing in different cultural codes um, from all the different cultures that I have experienced and um, found some sort of home in. And I think um, for me and my work um, for specifically, I guess this piece, uh, Honey Trap, Another thing that was very like interesting to me was I was looking at both my research for my master's, which was looking at all these Southeast Asian TV and film uh, female roles. And um, then I was kind of applying those archetypes that I coded from those, from those uh, materials into um, using these very westernized um, pornographic magazines like Playhouse, uh, Playboy and Penthouse. And I think there was, there was definitely a very interesting um, clash uh, when I was actually making the work in that I did feel that it was specifically because of my experience growing up overseas and now living and working in Singapore that I was able to kind of try and bridge that gap or break down that gap what we know is the east and the west um and it was more about like being specific and being specifically um my experience like as a as a southeast asian woman who did not grow up in southeast asia and now living here oh, that's great um i mean as we talk about the east and west there also has been a surge of interest in female artists um in the west in recent years more attention has been given to female artists and female representation in the art world which kind of goes back to Stephanie, your point about you know the patriarchal system here in Singapore. Uh, as female artists yourselves, do you all feel that the reception towards female artists in Southeast Asia is changing, or has changed in tandem with the West? You know, what are some of the challenges you all have faced when developing your practice in this regard? Stephanie, do you want to go first? <laughs> no, I don't want to go. <laughs> Lizzie, you can go. <laughs> Lizzie, do you, do you want to talk about it? Because, I mean, you look at female agency in your practice and your work, Honey Trap, like you said, subverts the idea of the seductress, you know, but can very easily be misread as sexual just by the mainstream media. Yeah, um, sure. I think, um, I guess I'll, I'll also kind of build on what Steph was saying before about her research materials, being that she saw all these um, kind of advice comics for women and how they were always crying. I thought that was very interesting because um, I guess for me in looking at my research materials, 
um, all the women that were portrayed were very much either kind of, there was this binary going on, either they're very innocent and corruptible um, by the men or by other people in their lives and kind of become these very desirable women um, or they're very worldly and very wild. So there is this kind of like disconnect between um, kind of the, the roles or the, the expectations that I think women in society like were kind of expected to, to fulfill all these different like roles, which I thought was kind of interesting, I guess, to relate my research materials to Steph's. Um, but I guess specifically for Honey Trap, um, what can be misread as purely only sexual and um, maybe very shocking um, in uh, definitely a Southeast Asian context. Um, I feel that I, I'm not, I'm not quite sure um, how uh, bold it is, uh, because I think from my understanding, I guess, growing up overseas, uh, although it is a, a powerful move to, I guess, own your body and to kind of um, be a sexual being, that in both kind of East and West societies, this role of the seductress, I think, is both desired and rejected, both loved and feared by different people. And there's this kind of power that the seductress figure can hold. Um, and yeah, I think looking at, looking at female agency in the work, um, I think particularly for me, I, I have maybe faced a few bumps in the road um, that were a little unexpected. Uh, I didn't expect um, my work to face any censorship or um, uh, I guess um, uh, considerations for future showings that I didn't really think about that, oh, if it's shown in this space or if a show is funded by this kind of funding body that I would have to be very considerate because it is of a sexual nature, it is pretty pornographic, even though I tried to make it quite tasteful <laughs> and obscure uh, certain body parts. Um, but even uh, a funny thing is that when I was trying to post some images from my work to Instagram, it was immediately taken down for nudity. Um, and I think there is still a lot of policing that happens on uh, images and female bodies, both um, online and in, in real life. And it's very clear when I have other friends who are male and they post images of their own bodies and that is not removed and not censored in the same way that I have seen so far of my own work and my own body. Mm -hmm. I mean, censor censorship is a, is, a, is a huge topic and definitely not, not only limited to Singapore, uh, but like you said, very much in the media and how they police like certain images and, and female nudity. Um, Stephanie, would you, do you have any thoughts to share? Mm, uh, uh, oh, what's the question again? <laughs> <laughs> um, as, a, as a female artist, you know, do you feel like the reception is changing? towards oh. female artists in, in Southeast Asia or like any challenges that you have faced you know in, when developing oh. a practice I think there are too few female artists in Singapore <sighs> and there should be a more and I think that there are more with the younger generation and the ones who survive the longest are very few and it's very sad okay. yeah and I think that there needs to change and I think that to have a healthy ecosystem is to have older female artists that you can look at and admire and like to move on you know as with as the country progresses and but there's a very big uh yeah there's just a very big lapse I think between um from one generation to the next and 
I just hope that things, I think things are changing. Uh. I think that more, more younger people are graduating and coming back and like are doing cool things. And like, I think people are invested. I think people are changing their mindset about it. I think like there's more um, uh, industrial help um, from, from institutional help, sorry, as well. And I think those things are all very important to build a healthy equivalent state. Yeah, and I, I, do, I do see a change happening and I hope it continues. Uh. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, Shane and Quinn, do either of you have anything to add on this issue? I have time, right? Yeah, yeah, we still have time. Since my work uh, talked a lot about the uh, pre-colonial period, and I just think that it's very important to also look into how female uh, was like in the colonial period. And because we, we, we always like the question itself also, like how we are, uh, whether we are on going on par with the rest and, and sort of uh, thinking in that way uh, makes me really want to think back. So, where do all this begin? Where do all the uh, inequality begin? And really take all the way back to the past and how is it like in pre-colonial period? And, and, and then I also realized that uh, modernity is very uh, built on patriarchal model. So uh, in region like Southeast Asia in the past, the female had more autonomy than as compared to uh, during the colonial period and then beyond where uh, the private sector and, and the public sector is uh, further uh, separated where uh, the male went out to work and and, and he moved at home to tell uh, tell real and and during the pre-colonial period a lot of female like especially the indigenous population not so much the Indian and the Chinese and, and other uh, races, races they, 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 they do work, a lot of females do work in trading, trading and so they have more economic power. So that, that's really fully removed from them. So in a way, it's not so much like people always see a modernity as progression, but it's sometimes it could be like region like Southeast Asia, uh, really like a downgrade to uh, less freedom. And, and like we think about uh, feminism and also think about uh, uh, LGBTQ issues and LGBTQ communities and then almost think about how in this region there are a lot to uh, really uh, learn again, learn back again, we learn all this, uh, like for example, the Buddhist people, their gender are very diverse in the past, but they are just slowly moving towards uh, less tolerant because of uh, all this continual, uh, I think, colonial influence in law as well. Yeah. So I think, you know, that's something that I think pre colonial period is very important to look into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Quinn, do you have anything to add? I just think that um, uh, I just work with um, exotism. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Oh, fantastic. Um, thank you. With that, we'll round out the discussion as we're running close to time. So thank you to the artists for sharing such wonderful insights. We will now open the discussion to questions from the audience. I think we have received two questions from the audience. Um, one question was posed to Shane. Thank you for presenting your interesting works and thoughts. I agree that the issue of colonialism, neo od cannot be limited to the East and West binary. Japan was an Asian colonizer in the early 20th century. Your work, 1963, Death of Democracy, does it refer to communism in China as well as the totalitarian, totalitarianism in Singapore? I just wonder how your Chinese upbringing influenced your work. Oh, it's really a tough question. So I think, but just mainly on the Chinese upbringing, um, I think uh, because uh, I, oh, sorry. No, it's fine. I mean, you started collecting 
I mean, you collect vintage pastry molds, and this was very much uh, prominent in your earlier works. You know, was it something that perhaps your upbringing has influenced you, or you started, you know, um, collecting these? That is the part where I just started thinking about my own identity because I feel like in this current uh, uh, period where a lot of uh, I mean, we are getting more globalized each time and then we slowly don't really know our own cultural roots. So that's why I start to get more interested in that. But on whether Chinese upbringing influences work, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really know whether it is because of that. I, I don't really see a direct relation, but more because uh, my grandparents uh, were here during that period and also their, their, their parents. So which is why I feel like this anti-colonial period is very linked to their experiences. And talking about communism in China, I know like in Singapore, they, this period is the time where they always label, especially the Chinese as uh, communists because of uh, China as well. But it's, it's really quite different from China because right here in Singapore, we were trying to uh, they were they were anti they, they were anti-colonial movement. So to label someone as just communist for being anti-colonial is just yeah I, I I don't get that you know as uh to this point I, I do see that as a very uh there's a lot of layers to why they're being labeled as such and also it's a lot on uh political disagreement uh rather than uh capturing someone because they are communist and 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 I do feel like for example being Chinese product we there's this separation of uh how even I guess in the PAP uh like there are a lot more of the Chinese part of the PAP in uh in the past when it just uh when it was just founded, they are, they are the Anglo-speaking, Anglo, Anglo, uh, Anglophones, and then they are Sinophone, and then also other races. It's not just Chinese and 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 but just nice mainly those uh, trade unions and workers are mainly Chinese speaking compared to because usually uh, the English speaking they are more they went to and some of them like for example Lee Kuan Yew they went to he went to UK to study so I guess their experience is very different from people who speak in Chinese so in that way I guess I relate I relate even more to this part of history and it could be because of my Chinese upbringing but and but it can't just be generalized again to that because there are also many other races in this uh in this period of anti-colonial yeah mm -hmm. yeah I answer, it's like a lot of history and many layers of different readings and yeah yeah i mean there's a lot of nuances when it comes to politics but like i feel like uh in your work, when you bring in Singapore's history, I think it's also a way for you to understand a time that's somewhat so detached from our generation uh, and making sense of that. I also have another question from Cheryl. Uh, if to any of the artists, if you had the opportunity to develop a second iteration of the exhibition, would you continue to work in the same medium or explore a different medium? Would, would you do anything differently? Stephanie, Lizzie, anyone wants to give it a go? Uh, I can go first, I guess. Um, yeah, I think I have been thinking about what I would do if I were to follow up um, this show, being having another opportunity to work with everyone again. Um, I would definitely still like to work with video. I think I am very much still a video artist, um, but I have really enjoyed um, using um, installation to kind of create the whole sensorial and immersive experience. So I would probably still like to include that um, aspect. Um, yeah, I, I think for me, I would 
be very interested to look at one of the other archetypes that I was researching. Um, one of them, the other kind of like negative archetype um, is the evil woman or the villainous. And I think kind of doing a deep dive into that would be very interesting for me. And I think maybe would part two for my work, but I think also would be nice to kind of uh, jive with everyone else's work. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Um, does any, anyone else want to talk about this? Mm, I recently ventured into film. So maybe film. Well, that would be very interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I think, you know, we're, we're, we're at 4 right now, we're at 4 p.m. So I think I'll round it up here. Um, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon and thank you to our four art artists for the thoughtful discussion. Uh, the exhibition Ornamental is on view at your workshop till 9 January next year and we warmly invite you all to come to see the show if you have yet to. Thank you all and have a very lovely evening. <laughs>